Hi everyone, in this video I want to do another example of uh, change in equilibrium. Except this one time I'm going to do something that affects the demand curve. And we're going to say, for the sake of argument, for whatever reason, firms become more optimistic about the future, so they want to invest more at every single real interest rate. So if you think about the structure of what we went through before, it was step one, what's the initial equilibrium? Well, we're starting off in the initial equilibrium point A, and what's so special about that? Quantity demand equals quantity supplied, so nobody has an incentive to change the real interest rate. Now, we're at step two. What's step two? There's a change. What's the change? Firms become more optimistic about uh, the future for whatever reason they think all investment projects are going to be more uh, profitable than they thought in the past. Maybe it's some new technology, maybe it's a change in government regulation, maybe just they just think the economy is going to boom over the next five or ten years. Whatever the reason, the important thing is firms become more optimistic about the future. They think investment projects are going to become more profitable. All right. So now you have to take a look at the situation that was just, just described and ask, does it affect the supply curve or demand curve? Well, the supply curve is de determined by national savings. So this increased optimism by firms doesn't directly affect national savings, so the supply curve for loanable funds is not going to shift. However, expectations about the future or just the expectations of firms in general was one of those things we held constant when we drew the demand curve. So we know the demand curve is going to shift. And in particular, we know if firms become more optimistic about the future, they think investment projects have become more profitable, they're going to want to go out and invest more. Well, to invest, they're going to have to borrow. That means the quantity demand of loanable funds is increased, or they're going to want to um, borrow more loanable funds at the initial interest rate. So what that means is the demand curve has shifted, and let's say it's shifted out towards here. We'll call it D2. And to be consistent with the last video, I'll call that point B. And we'll say, for the sake of argument, we'll pretend this real interest rate stays fixed at R2. All right. So the question is, now we're in step two. There's been a change, increased optimism of the firms. So what's happened? The demand curve shifts to the right from D1 to D2. So I can draw a little arrow showing the shift there. Now the question is, what exists in the market? Is it going to be a shortage or a surplus? So at the real interest rate R2, with the new demand curve, what exists? Shortage or surplus? Well, to figure that out, we're going to have to look at two things, quantity demand and quantity supplied. To find quantity supplied, we're going to go from the real interest rate over to the supply curve, which happens to be at point A and down. And we'll call that quantity supplied 2. And we'll put that right there. Now, to find quantity demand, we're going to go from real interest rate 2 all the way over to the new demand curve, curve, because that's the one that's relevant, and down. And we'll call that quantity demand 2. And we're going to find that quantity demand 2 is greater than quantity supplied 2, i.e., shortage exists. That means there's some firm out there that would like to borrow but can't because it can't find a bank or someone willing to loan to them at the current interest rate of R2. All right, so that's the second step, the change. The third step is going to be the market adjusts. So there's a built-in tendency for markets to adjust to this shortage. Specifically, at this real interest rate R2, there's a shortage, meaning there's some firm out there that would like to borrow that can't because they can't find a firm or a bank who's willing to lend to them. Well, think about it. If you're a firm, you've got some fantastic investment project that you would love to fund. How do you convince banks to loan to you rather than somebody else? You offer to pay a higher real interest rate. So because of the shortage, that's going to lead firms to bid up the real interest rate. They don't bid up R. So the real interest rate is going to start rising. And the real interest rate doesn't rise because firms like banks and want them just to have, um, you know, more money or anything like that. They do it because the bank or the firms, the, the reason the firms bid up the real interest rate is because they have no choice. If you want an investment project, then you've got to bid it up, bid up real interest rates higher. Why? Because there's not enough funds to go around. All right. So now, we're into the adjustment. So the increase in the real interest rate is going to cause two changes. The first change is as the real interest rate goes up, 
then this is going to increase the cost of borrowing. Uh, borrowing. And so that's a signal to firms. And that's going to decrease the quantity demand. Why? Well, there's going to be a lot of firms out there who say, hey, this was a wonderful investment project at the slow interest rate R2. But now as real interest rates start rising, say if R2 is 1%, they start rising to 1.5%, 2 3%, some of those investment projects aren't going to be worth it anymore, which means some firms are going to say, you know what, at the higher real interest rate, we're just not going to bother, we're, we're just not going to invest, which means we're not going to borrow, so the quantity demand for loanable funds begins to fall. Okay. Likewise, the increase in the real interest rate increases the reward for savings, reward for savings, and as the reward for savings increases, then that's a signal to households that, hey, it's, uh, you're going to get more if you delay consumption and you put money in your savings account so banks can turn around and lend it out. So as the interest rate rises from, say, 1% to 2 or 3 or 4, more and more people are going to save more and more of their income. So that's going to end up increasing quantity supplied of loanable funds. So the increase in real interest rate causes you to move up along the demand curves, quantity demand falls, it causes you to move up along the supply curve, so quantity supplied increases, and when do you stop? That's the fourth step. You stop when you reach the new equilibrium, which I'm going to label here C, where the real interest rate has risen all the way to R3, and now you're at quantity 3. And hopefully by this point, if you've watched all the videos, you the next step was going to be obvious. And what's so special about quantity 3? Because at quantity 3, quantity supplied is again going to equal quantity demanded, meaning every single firm that wants to borrow to finance investment can find a bank who's willing to lend to them, so they have no more incentive to build, bid up the real interest rate. Likewise, every bank that wants to lend at their interest rate R3 can find a firm that's willing to borrow, so banks have no incentive to bid down the real interest rate. All right, so that's the last video uh, for change in equilibrium using the loan mill funds model. I did two examples. You ought to be able to figure out the other possible examples on your own. And just like uh, I should also mention before I go, I did an example here of firms become more optimistic about the future. Anything that shifts the demand curve to the right will have exactly the same effect. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a cut in corporate taxes. It could be, you know, a decrease in government regulations that makes investment more profitable or whatever. No matter what it is, if it causes firms to want to invest more, the entire demand curve is going to shift to the left.